This is the lecture for Thursday, 9th September 2021 for European history. Last time we were here, we talked about the beginnings of this course, which start with theories of, uh, or the beginnings of human history that are behind and before what we teach in this course, which begins with universal creation, whatever that is, myths of it, and it comes uh, down to, you all set now? You okay? Good. Um, the end of the Middle Ages, and we covered by far the largest period in summary yesterday, uh, ancient times, times, where as far as human beings are concerned, the um, rise from savagery to culture to civilization, where we go from being nomadic hunter-gatherers, where all men hunt and all women gather, to farming communities that are small individual farmsteads, then towns, then cities. And with cities come the rise of civilizations, cultures that are bound together by core beliefs, but that have specialized labor, writing, advanced technology, complex institutions. Cultures that have learned to solve the problems of crowding people together and keeping them productive and alive. Cities tend to act, as the Greeks understood, as lenses of creativity, bringing people together in close proximity in order to interact in a productive way. When I used to work for a pharmaceutical company as security, I worked in a state-of-the-art facility that had just been built by Bristol Myers Squibb, and the entire facility was designed to have various specialty scientists come together during breaks and lunches to sit in beautiful spots overlooking the countryside like they were in a medieval castle where they would snack and have coffee and talk because Bristol Myers was willing to invest tens of millions of dollars in the prospect that if you put neuroscientists next to oncologists, next to cardio specialists, next to neurologists, I may have said that already, uh, that you will get sparks that wouldn't happen within the specialties. So the specialties were within the labs, but mixing was occurred in every public space. So, in cities, you have peoples of pe peoples. You have people of all kinds, and these people come together. And what a civilization done does is it brings them together in a manner that makes them more than the sum of their parts. More than the sum of their parts. Like we, as living multicellular creatures, we are more than the sum of our parts. If you took an equivalent number of paramecium or amoebae. Equivalent to the number of cells in our body, which would be countless myriad numbers, ridiculous numbers, they would never have a thought. They would never be able to perceive the visual world. They would never be able to move uh, a stick. We, as individuals, as discrete multicellular beings, with our central nervous system and our muscular structure and our skeletal structure, we are more than the sum of our parts. Cities do that with masses of people, creating a civilization that pops, that does not simply maintain itself, but that brings progress. Through the creative process of countless individuals coming together in daily life, buying, selling, negotiating, fighting, loving. And in all of these ways, as we interact, our insights might be sparked. We might have an epiphany that we would never have had if everything were calm and routine. This is the great lie of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or of any racialist ideology. The notion that by being pure blood, or purely culturally uh, without any foreign influences, will be better off, that never happens in biology. 
in biology, American bred German Shepherd lines have hip dysplasia as a result of close inbreeding. German and Eastern European German Shepherd lines do not have this problem. They have other problems, but not this particular problem. And the reason that German Shepherds, uh, like any purebred dogs, does tend to have problems is because nature did not intend for dogs to breed in such a way as to produce the distinct German Shepherd dog. Nature intended for dogs to breed more catholically. And what I mean by that is more universally with other canines. Um, so, you know, the same ancestor produces the Chihuahua and the massive, uh, what is it, uh, Malamute? Uh, no, Malamute's in Alaska, like a husky. Look at those huge dogs. Great Danes are one. There's another that I'm thinking of. They're big and shaggy. What? Newfoundland? Uh, yeah, Newfoundland dogs. Is that what you were saying? I couldn't hear you through the mess. Something like St. Bernard's, St. Bernard's, Newfoundland's, and Great Danes. So imagine, um, don't imagine this too closely because this is not the Discovery Channel after dark, but imagine a Chihuahua and a Newfie can crossbreed. They're cross-fertile because they're both dogs. Um, so having something that is too pure, too much of any one thing, tends to make it sterile. One of the reasons the United States has had such success over the centuries is that we tend to skim the most ambitious middle and lower class people from other countries because they have more opportunities here than they have in their homelands. This at least was true during the great, great wave of migration throughout the 1800s and into the early 1900s. Today's immigration laws befuddle me and I couldn't describe their efficacy without cursing because they don't seem to be traditional American. If you want, you know, bring us your, t send us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I hold my light behold the, beside the golden door. Statue of Liberty poem. Um, it is more that, I don't know. I don't know. But traditionally, American immigration has been about attracting people from all over the world who want to be free. And it is that attraction that has given us such amazing talent. If we didn't have that attraction, that talent would have benefited Germany or the Ukraine, Lithuania or uh, Italy or uh, Afghanistan or Zimbabwe, China or um, the Maldives. So cities, by bringing many different types of people together and compressing them and forcing them to interact, sparks those insights that bring progress. Human civilization begins in the river valleys because of the fecundity of fecundity. I, I love saying that word. Because of the fertile, fertile nature of the soil. And um, you have the thriving civilizations across Eurasia from... Uh, in chronological order, Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, India, and China. Ultimately, in the West, Greece forms, gives us notions of personal creativity, democracy, philosophy, foundations of drama and science. Rome then conquers the Greek, well, actually, Greece then conquers the Persian world. And uh, under Alexander the Great, the cultural alloy that is, not to say feminism, no, Ugh. Uh, that is Hellenism. Well, Helen was uh, that, that is Hellenism, the blending of the best of Greek and Persian cultures, uh, comes about. Christianity is a Hellenistic religion in that the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the New Testament is written in Greek, the Old Testament is the story of the Israelites and their relationship with the one true God. Uh, Christianity is the story about how the Messiah predicted in that other religion is for all people, including Greeks, including Romans, including other Gentiles. In fact, it is a universal salvation that is offered. Um, Rome conquers the Greek world and takes on some Hellenized ideas. Rome gives us the military, gives us uh, the Republic, gives us a sense of how effective laws can be, uh, and gives us also the empire, which is the template for all large-scale imperial administration in the Western world since. 
But the Roman world decays. It decays because of a variety of factors. First of all, the Augustan Compromise, where you have a monarchy with Republican forms, only works if the Republican forms are obeyed. So, Augustus is a king in everything but name. The Roman people are treated formally as if they are still free. In fact, Augustus is like a crime lord that controls everything in his society that he wants to control. And in the end, Augustine, the Augustan Compromise is a solution to the problem of ongoing civil wars. When the Republic fell, it fell slowly. It fell when the when the tribunes, Gaius and Tiberius Gracchus, were murdered by their political enemies in public, in broad daylight, and the murderers got away with it. The Republic did not function, could not function, if it couldn't protect the lives of two tribunes. Tribunes who are inviolate by Roman custom and law, you can't touch them in the course of their duties, or they will, um, or the curse of the gods will be on the city. And it was. Because after the assassinations of Gaius and uh, Tiberius Gracchus, Marius decides that he's going to buy a private army out of the urban poor, the Roman mob. Sulla does the same thing, and then you have a period of civil wars. The Augustan Compromise is the solution to all of that. But because it was a, an a monarchy with republican forms, you couldn't have a succession law. The problem of imperial succession was insoluble, insolvable, unsolvable. Insoluble means you can't dissolve it in water. <laughs> or is that indissoluble? In any event. No, insoluble. Thank you. Ask Mr. McCormick. He knows! Yeah. He knows because he's a science teacher. Is he? Yeah. Hey, I thought he was an English teacher. Uh, that's fine. Well, he, he teaches in the English language, so in effect, we are all English teachers. Okay. Just ask, just ask the English department, they'll tell you. In any event, sometimes the imperial succession is done by the selection of the old emperor. Sometimes it is done through the bloodline, like the Julio-Claudians or the Flavians. But by the 3rd century AD, by the early 200s, there had been so many civil wars shaking the system that the question of who becomes the emperor when the old emperor dies becomes a question of which army group, which mass of legions has a general that could win against all the other legions. And for a 50-year period, from AD 230 until AD 284, you have ongoing constant civil war where the Roman army literally destroys itself in constant fighting with itself while the Gothic uh, threat on the northern frontier doubles what the German threat used to be, and while the Persian threat on the eastern frontier uh, triples or quadruples or quintuples what the old Parthian threat used to be. The Roman Empire is reformed as a dominate under Diocletian, where everything is regulated. You even have communist-style wage and price controls, where the imperial government decides how much a loaf of bread will cost. How much a baker will charge for it? Where the imperial government dictates that you will do what your daddy did for a living. Locking people in. By the 5th century, the 400s AD, the Roman Empire was filled with a people that was passive. That was peaceful that was used to being governed by the central authority. And when it came time for them as individuals to defend themselves against the barbarian hordes that the central authority could not protect them from, most of the Romans couldn't find it within themselves to grab a weapon, strap on some armor, and go fight for their freedom. They lost it go fight for their way of life. They lost it. Go fight for their lands. They lost it. And these Romans called themselves by the same name that the Romans of the Republic called themselves, and those Romans equated military service with citizenship. 
Freedom is only for the brave, and only those who are willing to put their life on the line for their country deserve a say in its future. That's all gone. The Romans of the late empire asked Germans and Goths to fight for them. Eventually the Germans and Goths realized they don't need the Romans anymore because they can take whatever they want. And the empire falls, divided into barbarian kingdoms. The only aspect of the central authority that remains is the Christian church centered on Rome centered on the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. Now, other reasons why the Empire fell include the beautiful, wonderful, fantabulous, supercalifragilistic, expialidocious plumbing systems that the Romans used. Why? What was it about Roman, Roman pl plumbing that, according to our lights, is dicey? Oh, it had lead inside. Uh-huh! Lead! In the mid-20th century, we realized that lead poisoning is actually incredibly dangerous. I remember when I was a little boy having lead pipes removed from various buildings because they had used lead as the solder, because lead is a very effective material to use when soldering two, two pieces of metal together. But the problem is that if you consume liquid that has been touched and tainted by lead, slowly but surely, you and your descendants will devolve into idiocy. As if you had been the victims of incest, as if you had had close breeding within the family. Birth defects arise, and intellect IQs fall. So the people of Rome, who benefited the most from civilization, the urbanites, the city dwellers, the upper class, the people who had the running water, who had fountains in their own homes, were the most affected. And there was a de general de de degeneration of intellect and intellectual capacity within the empire. Part of that was due to the lead, part of that was due to a cultural stagnation. Christianity was one of the only things that brought life back into late imperial culture, but it wasn't enough to save the empire. So now the Roman Empire has fallen. It's 476, and after 476, and we are in the Middle Ages. And this is where we get up to where we were last time. There is this roiling, boiling, percolating anarchy of many different factors. Remnants of Greek ideas, Roman ideas, Christian ideas, and the ideas and lifestyles of the Germanic barbarians that conquered Rome. And they all come together, but the only one that's organized is the Christian church. There are two basic axioms, that is, universal laws, that apply to medieval life across the board in Europe. Let me tell you what they are. You should write them down if you don't already know them. Bone deep. The first is, you are what your daddy does. You are what your daddy does. You are what your daddy does. And what you are, what your daddy does means is that your identity is inherited. It is not chosen. We live in a time where people muck around with all sorts of creativity regarding their identity. I identify as a pink lampshade. I identify as an artichoke. I identify as a shark with a freaking laser on my head. People are experimenting with whether gender is merely a social construct or whether it's a physical reality. I know what I think. You will be developing your ideas. But... That's because we are so civilized and so comfortable that we have the widespread free time to explore these things. Most people throughout the world are too busy struggling to live, struggling to get good work so they can support their families, struggling to make a better future for themselves because life is much harder than it is here in these United States. We in the decadent West are playing games because we are so wealthy, but we inherited that wealth from the people who built it back in World War II and before, back in the 1960s and 70s and before. We have allowed our industry to go overseas. We have allowed our society to drift. And there are good things too. We're a lot more equitable than we used to be. 
But the basic American premise is that you, as an individual, can choose huge aspects of your identity. Are you going to live in the native town where you were raised, or are you going to cross the country? Are you going to take up a familiar trade to your family, or are you going to go off and try to make it as an actor in Hollywood? Or are you going to go to try to make it as a writer in New York? Are you going to try to be on the stage, or are you going to try to become an athlete? Or do you want to join the military when your family are pacifists? Or do you want to avoid the military if your family are veterans? We allow and encourage every single one of you to choose your future. Have big dreams. Embrace ambitions that are worthy of your freedom so that freedom is not wasted on you. But freedom is only for the brave. If you don't have the courage to dream big, you'll take what's offered to you. That's not necessarily a bad life, but it's not a very bold one. And you might be frustrated by it in the long run. In the United States, you have no one to blame but yourself for how your life turns out. Daytime television is filled with TV shows with people whinging about how their parents didn't love them as much as they should. All this other nonsense. No. In a free society, you can control your fate. If there's a problem in your life, it's your fault. Fix it. But I didn't do that, so I don't care. Your fault, fix it. Why is it your fault? Because you can take your life and do things with it. Over years of time, you can transform yourself from a 90-pound weakling into a bodybuilder. You can transform yourself from an ignoramus into a scholar. And you can transform yourself from a pauper into a plutocrat. All it requires is vision hard work, and a little bit of luck. And if you're not happy with your life, change. Change. You are empowered. This is a free society. In the Middle Ages, you were defined by your birth. Yes? Um, what are these regards? Like what? I'm sorry, I don't understand. You, you said the two things. Your yeah, you know, that's the first thing. I haven't done, done yeah, the second thing. What is it like in reference to the, yeah, the two things? Yes. Okay, you are what your daddy does is referencing the Middle Ages. Okay, item one, aspect B, the Middle Ages. This is one aspect. Your identity is inherited. If you are a male and your father grew turnips for a living, you're going to grow turnips. If you are female and your father grew turnips for a living, you will have an arranged marriage where you marry somebody who basically probably has the same status as somebody who grows turnips for a living. Your status, your identity, who you are and what you will do, where you will live and what you will be is inherited. You receive it as a, as a, as a quality of birth. Like today you receive your genetics. Do you have red hair or yellow hair or brown hair or no hair? Do you have, uh, are you tall? Are you short? Are you stout? Are you slim? These things are inherited traits. Do you have a naturally high intellectual capacity? That's inherited. Are you incredibly athletic? That's inherited. Are you? But you, what you do with your inheritance is your choice. In America, in the Middle Ages, you are expected to follow in the footsteps of your ancestors. In other words, your birth determines your destiny. That's what I mean by you are what your daddy does. Now, if you're a female, you are what your father did. Then you are what your husband did. If you don't marry, you are what your brother does. Then when everyone dies and you're a little old lady, you are what your son does. There, one of the great lies of feminism is it implies that there's a patriarchal male conspiracy. And we all have meetings and we don't invite you to them. And, and we talk about how we're going to rule the women's. Um, the implication is that women have been on the bottom of society throughout all history. Yeah, you have. Back in ancient times, you were considered to be property and breeders. Um, but... What happened is, so were men. Most men were born into some form of servitude. You were born to be a slave, or you were born to be a peasant, or you were born to be a serf. It's not like men had much of a choice either. You were born into a role. 
God put you there. If God didn't want you to be a tailor, then he wouldn't have made your papa a tailor. If God didn't want you to be the wife of a tanner, then he wouldn't have made your papa somebody who was in the tanning industry or somebody who was in some other guild industry that would have a, a good arranged marriage. Even today in Europe, there are vestiges of this where you have a highly stratified, yeah, stratified society where the, there is this sense of class identity and where in England, for example, somebody grows up in a project, a housing project somewhere, very lower class, and they decide they're going to go to school and in the school they pick up a posh accent and they go to a university and they become an architect. They're a class trader. There are many people in their old neighborhood who will hate that. Because instead of becoming one of us, you became one of them. In the United States, we are only developing this, and it's a bad thing to develop. Because in the United States, we both, both have a frontier mentality that's much closer to our present day than what is in Europe. And we also have a constant inflow of immigrants who stir things up. However, I've got to say, within my lifetime, I have seen the son of a president become president. I have seen the wife of a president try to become president. I have seen several senators and congressmen who seem to inherit their office. I, and also, those people who are in the highest offices in the land have fewer connections to the military than at any time in our history. In other words, the sons of these elite people do not take the time to serve their country in uniform, which used to be something that was expected of leaders. I guess if you don't understand what I'm saying by you are what your daddy does, hopefully that will have explained it. You don't choose your identity in the Middle Ages. It's inherited. There are rare occasions where a poor person is raised to the knighthood or to nobility. But those are extraordinarily unusual cases. The society is designed to keep people in place. And this started in the late Roman Empire because wealthy people wanted to avoid the tax man. You could have the wealthiest person in town become a slave, sell themselves into slavery to avoid the tax man, to avoid debt from taxation. To prevent this, the imperial government basically codified into law that your status would be an inheritance. That's the first one. You have any questions about that? You are what your daddy does. Your identity is a birth characteristic. It is inherited. Okay, I see no questions. Second, God and his church are at the center of all things. God and his church are at the center of all things. Remember to capitalize H and his. God and his church are at the center of all things. The only organization which survives the fall of Western Empire intact is the Roman Catholic Church, the Western Christian Church, the Christian Church organized from Rome by the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. They are the only ones to maintain contact on a continental scale. I almost never use these, so I might as well try to use this one now. So here, here's a map of the late Roman Empire, but don't worry about the borders. Here in Rome, the Pope resides. Western Christian civilization is basically throughout what we would today call Western and Central Europe, Southern and Northern Europe, the East, not so much yet. The Roman Catholic Church has connection to parishes and churches throughout the Visigothic Kingdom of Spain, the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy, the Frankish Kingdom that we now call France, the Visigothic Kingdom in North Africa, they send missionaries. St. Augustine, the other St. Augustine, the one who does not write the City of God, St. Augustine, the missionary, is sent across the English Channel to the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to re-Christianize Britain. The Christian Roman Britons have been pushed to the West, and so new things. So the only organization which communicates on a continental scale is the Roman Catholic Church. The only organization that cares for the everyday needs of the people is the Roman Catholic Church. 
God and his church are at the center of all things. You cannot be born without a church keeping records. You cannot be born and raised without the church engaging in the sacrament of baptism, which invites you into the uh, patrimony of Christ, which invites you into the community of the Christian faith. Usually it's done at infancy. You have your first confession. You have your first Holy Communion, where you literally invite God to inhabit you by taking in bread and wine, transmogrified Christ's body and blood, or symbolic, depending upon what kind of Christian you are. The Church records and marries you. The Church takes care of keeping your children trapped. So if you engage in genealogy, the study of your family's history, you will often go quickly from the 18 or 1700s from government records to church records because they're the only ones that kept this. If you're starving, go to the church, get alms for the poor. If you're sick, you go to a monastery, get healed. If you are ignorant, the only people who read and write in society in the dark ages are churchmen and people trained by churchmen. Poor Charlemagne, king of the uh, new Holy Roman Empire, uh, the Carolingian kingdom in France. Charlemagne, the most successful man of his time, struggles at his desk with his letters like a, an errant schoolboy because he wants to learn to read and write. And he's not learning as a child, he's learning as an adult, and he's not learning to read and write in his native Frankish language. He's learning to read and write in Latin. God and his church are at the center of all things. You can't engage in a week's activity without being summoned to services on Sunday. Feast days are religious. And even the kings, the temporal powers that rule the land, kneel in coronation, and they are shrieved and blessed by priests, bishops, and cardinals, maybe even the pope like Charlemagne himself, given holy oil in a parasacrament of coronation where the king swears by Christ to rule and protect God's people in our Lord's name. So the church is involved with everything. And this is the heart of medieval society. You are what your daddy does, you inherit your identity, and God and his church are at the center of all things. If you want to be an ambitious person in life, you don't try to get a better job. You try to lead a decent life, a good, generous life within the status God put you. Yes? Um, my dad just celebrated uh, one of the feast days on Monday. Monday night was... Yeah. Do you remember what it was? No, but I know it was supposed, supposed to be like the... Uh, around the time he was born. But was... Like one of the that okay, well, that's because there are some stories in some of the Gospels that have shepherds in the fields yeah. when Jesus is born. And that that's not December, not in Judea. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it's Sukkoth uh, or, or the Yom, Kipp Yom Kippur. Uh, Yom Kippur is a day of atonement. I associate it with October, but I could be wrong. I'm not sure. Uh, if, you, if you find out, let me know. Yeah. So understand something. One of the realities in the world today is that there is a struggle by radical Islam against the West. That's something I'm focusing on with my ancient history students as I talk about the historical backgrounds of the September 11th, 2001 terrorist atrocities. The Christian world goes through a transformation, which we're going to cover in a week or two. And that transformation is from a medieval society where identity is inherited and where it is theocentric, where God and his church are at the center of everything, to what we are now, a secular society where people are free to worship within very broad limits as they please. Are you allowed to have a Baal worship where you sacrifice babies in the fire? No, we don't permit that. Are you allowed to be part of a religion that takes drugs wantonly? With one exception, no. 
certain Native American tribes are permitted to use peyote in their manhood rituals and their coming of age rituals because that's traditional. And peyote is a highly hallucinogenic uh, substance. But in general terms, we allow people very broad latitude within our laws to worship as they will. Up until recently, we've been broadly Judeo-Christian. That may or may not change. There are people certainly who want it to change, who want us to become purely secular. But we have been secular oriented, oriented towards more religious liberty since the 15 and 1600s, since the wars of religion ended in the mid 1600s. The Islamic world never went through that change. Neither the Ottoman Empire, the Persians, nor any of the Arab or Berber communities, nor the people in Pakistan, nor the people in Malaysia. None of them went through the historical process that brought Christendom, which was the alternative name of European Christian Western civilization, Christendom, which made Christendom become modern Europe, which moved us from an identity-inherited God-centric God society, bless you, to what we are now, which is a tolerant secular society. Having never gone through that, this is the fundamental difference. The fundamental difference between radical Islam and the West is not that we worship the same God differently. That's a small part of it. Yes, we worship the same God. God the Father, as Christians call him. Yahweh, as Jews call him, is Allah. It's that the culture of the Islamic world is still fundamentally in the Middle Ages. Whether they have oil, whether they have money, whether they have the tallest building in the world does not matter. They still see things in a medieval light. In fact, in some respects, they are still tribal in the sense that when Iraqis vote, they vote as their clan leader instructs them to vote. They don't vote as individuals. So this is a big deal. You should understand what a medieval mindset is. Identity is inherited, and it is theocentric. Any questions on that before we move on? The Dark Ages passed into a period around a thousand years ago called the High Middle Ages. The High Middle Ages are after the peak of Viking attacks. Viking attacks were the last gasp of the Dark Ages. The High Middle Ages are also characterized by the Norman conquest of England, <clears throat> where the Frenchified Viking William the Bastard of Normandy conquers England in 1066. It is typified by the Crusades. It is typified by the Holy Roman Empire, a maturing version of Charlemagne's France and Western Germany and North Italy, all unified. The High Middle Ages has the Crusades. But what really makes the High Middle Ages a distinct era is that for the first time since the fall of Imperial Rome, Europe builds cities. Rome is a backwater. Paris is not. Paris becomes a larger city. London becomes a larger city. Frankfurt in Germany becomes a larger city. Places in Belgium like Ghent and Antwerp become larger cities. When Europeans stop living in the Dark Ages and start building cities, they stop from being a protoculture and they start being a civilization again. Because they have cities again. Without cities, what was going on in Europe was sort of a cultural drift. With cities, civilization in Europe begins to lock down its distinct characteristics. So what makes the High Middle Ages the High Middle Ages is that Europeans begin building their own cities. During the Dark Ages in Western Europe, I'm not talking Byzantium, I'm not talking the Byzantine Empire, I'm talking Western Europe. With the exception of Isla Chapelle, Charlemagne's capital, they didn't build structures more than three stories tall. They had forgotten how. You try building a story, three structures, uh, structure three stories tall if you've forgotten how, and you'll end up with a giant pile of dirt and rocks with a bunch of dead people inside. Don't do that. It's a bad way to spend your afternoon. So, 
let's look at some things that make the high point, uh, that, that make the high Middle Ages what they are. The Normans, the Frenchified Vikings, conquered England and bring England to dominance in northwestern Europe. In Germany and North Italy and Eastern France, Sacrum Imperium Romanum, or Romanorum, my, my accent stinks, you Latin scholars can certainly attest to that. The Holy Roman Empire is the legacy of Charlemagne. France becomes separate from it very early on, but the Holy Roman Empire is this amalgamated superstate in the heart of Europe. Now, the French philosopher Voltaire in the 1700s once famously said, it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Ha ha, because he's such a sarcastic guy, Voltaire. You'll learn more about him. But whether it was holy or not, the Holy Roman Empire is holy because it is Christian. It's also holy because the Pope and the Emperor share power. The kings and the cardinals all have parallel roles. But the Pope and the Emperor share power. In fact, the Popes versus the Kings is a major factor in high medieval Europe. The ultimate papal victory happens at Canossa, when Pope Innocent III humbles the Holy Roman Emperor Henry, who has to come to him in the Italian Alps, kneel down in the middle of the snowstorm, and proclaim to the world, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. It is my fault, it is my fault, it is totally my fault. For hours the Pope made him kneel in the snow, shouting to the high heavens, he's sorry, and then the Pope came down and graciously accepted his apology. The Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire was humbled before the Pope. But that didn't last. A few decades later, the king of France decides that he wants his own pope. He wants a pope. So uh, he captures the pope and brings him to Avignon. Avignon is a beautiful town in southern France. And the Avignon popes pretend, purport, try to run the Roman Catholic Church as a tool of French policy for 70 years. And of course, when this happens, other kings want their popes. You got a pope, I got a pope. We all got popes. Pope, pope, pope. <laughs> Ultimately, there were seven or eight popes calling all other seven or eight popes anti-pope and anti-Christ. Because in this great schism, there was no unity. Ultimately, everyone realizes that this is a mistake that for Europe to work, the church and state, while not being closely partnered, must work in some degree of harmony. You could not have an ongoing civil war about who the leader of the faith was, or European civilization would disintegrate. So there's a new council, a new pope is elected, one pope to rule them all, and that pope is returned to Rome from the French city of Avignon. Who was the French king that took the first pope? I don't remember his name. Uh, By all means, look, feel free to look it up. No, no, it's just I have a disdain for French history, gotcha. so I, I know things about it that I have to. Uh, but by all means, and, and it's a silly disdain. It's like when I... I will often make fun of France, the French language, the French... And it, it's, it's not serious. I, uh, France is a cultured, wonderful place, and if you ever get a chance to go there, I think you should. But um, as many Anglophones, as many speakers of English... I find the French irritating and pretentious, uh, and so I, I have my little bits of fun, uh, but that's all it is. If you find out, come and tell me. I honestly don't remember. Uh, so, you have in the High Middle Ages an interesting society, unique in all the world, where the church and state are separate entities, where the kingdom does not control the church like they do in China, like they do in India, like they do elsewhere in the world, like they do in the Middle East. No, no, we have an independent church, and that is one of the things that brings the idea of personal liberty to the fore, and it's one of the things that brings the idea that even the king is under the law. Because the church can punish kings if they go too far. They can excommunicate them, kick them out. That's what happened to Henry. The Holy Roman Emperor Henry had become excommunicate. He had been kicked out of the church. And a king that takes a coronation oath to rule in Christ's name that is kicked out of Christ's church no longer has the authority to run his country. 
unlike any ruler anywhere else in the world, the Christian church can rebuke kings, can discipline kings, and can make it stick. It's not a constant supremacy the church has. It's an ongoing competition between church and state. Where we will continue next time is with the Crusades. Any questions or comments right now? Then you may talk quietly amongst yourselves until dismissal. Thank you.